여러분 안녕하십니까? 오셔서 감사합니다. And uh, this Dharma talk will be in English. And the title is Unchanging Mind in a Changing World. You can see that very well in this beautifully made poster. Now, you know from your studies and from your experience that in this world everything is changing. In Buddhism, we distinguish five levels of consciousness. The first five are physical, the upper three are mental. So, hearing, seeing, tasting, touching, smelling, that's all physical. Then we have cognitive thinking, discriminative thinking, or dualistic thinking, and memory, long term and short term. All the content of the eight consciousnesses are changing. So your memory changes, your judgments change, the way you form concepts, the way you talk, the way you analyze, that also changes. And of course, the objects of the first five, they also change. Korean rice tastes wonderful, but it never tastes the same. Even if you eat it on the same day, morning, lunch, and evening, they taste slightly different. So what is it that doesn't change? There is something which has no number, no body, no mind, no name, no form, no life, no death. And that's something that perceives all this, perceives the content and the process and the creation of the eight consciousnesses all together. Now, if this mind was some kind of individual mind, if this perception was somewhere, we could analyze it, we could locate it, but that's not what we are talking about. This, just like the universe, is everywhere. And in everything, not separate from mind and matter. So not separate from any of the eight levels of consciousness. But you can't grab it. You can't grasp it. But if you empty the eight levels of consciousness and terminate all your attachments and identifications, you can experience it. And that's the teaching of the Buddhas and patriarchs. That's the process of awakening. So just the way that you want to understand the world and see the world for what it is, see cause and effect in the world clearly, to the same extent, it is also very advisable to turn that energy inwards and perceive what we are, how we operate as human beings, what is the cause and effect relationship between our feelings and thoughts and speech and action. Now, if you can do that, then you can truly discover something which doesn't change. And you can do that only in this moment. Not in the past, not in the future, not in some imaginary present, but only in this moment. If you do that, you wake up. There are many names for this. Awakening, enlightenment, redemption, emancipation, when you elevate yourself to a higher state of consciousness. But in fact, this title is a little misleading. It says, unchanging mind. But this thing, this something that we talk about, is not a mind. It's not a mind like we have individually. But if we say something else in the poster, it would have been very complex and very kind of obscure. It would have been better if we wrote unchanging no mind in the changing world. But who would have listened? Who would have understood? Okay? At least in this way we believe we understand something. So this may seem like historical, religious or some kind of interesting but remote study. 
not so popular. How is this relevant today? Today's world is dependent on change. It's dependent on change way more than ever. Consumer society is living by changing the way you consume things, the way you entertain yourself, the way you make your trips to foreign countries, the way you dress, the way you eat. Everything is planned by those people who want to make money out of it. It started in earnest at the end of the 1960s, where marketing became like national policy. First in the United States, but very quickly in Western Europe, then rest of Europe, then pretty much everywhere in the world. In Korea, it started pretty much at the same time after the Korean War. President Park Chung-hee laid down the foundations of the new Korea. Those 20 years, Yorobun, are the foundations of your country today. But together with that came the import of an ever faster changing economy, society, and human being. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing wrong with change. There's nothing wrong with planned obsolescence, ever faster changing smartphones and tablets and computers and MP3 players. They're changing faster and faster, and that change by itself is neither good nor bad. But please look at the cause and effect, both inside and outside. If something changes too fast, what happens? You are stressed. And that stress is something that your mind, your perception, cannot keep up with the change. It moves with it. Imagine you're standing on the platform of Chonan Asan KTX Yog. It's a very interesting place. Because many KTX trains, they don't stop there at that station. They just woo, go straight to Tejon or woo, go straight to Yongsan or Seoul Yog. But you have no problem. There are four tracks and you're standing right at the edge of the outermost track. And all those fast trains are passing in the center. So no problem. You're standing there. And the train is going 300 kilometers per hour and boom, going straight through. Imagine you would touch that. It would break you apart. Seemingly, it would be just your hand touching the train at 300 k per hour, but you would die. It would rip you apart. So if your mind is attached to the change, any kind of fast change of zeros and ones, thoughts and feelings, in your consciousness... You go into this vertigo, into this very, very confused and unstable state of mind. You don't know where you are. You don't know what you're doing. Sometimes you don't know who you are because the change is so fast. So if you can detach from it and perceive it and attain this unmoving mind, then you can save yourself from suffering. It's number one important. That's why we say in... Sonbulgyo, keep this moment very clear. And if you keep this moment clear, then everything is clear. That means your mind doesn't move. All contents of your eight levels of consciousness, that can move. What you see, hear, taste, smell, touch, think, distinguish, and remember what you feel, what you say, what you do, they all change. There's something that doesn't change, and that's your not moving mind in this moment. This is the objective, the purpose of our practice when we practice meditation, or yombul, chanting, or bowing. Our tradition has many angles, moral, ethical, cognitive, historical, cultural, even culinary when we eat temple food. But all these are secondary layers. All these are necessary dressing on something more essential and more profound. So in this sense, if you attain this not moving mind, 
this clear, non-attached, non-identifying mind, and you don't touch the KTX at 300k per hour. But you wait until it stops, you get on, the door closes and you go with it. And that means you have a choice. What is it that gives you this kind of safety or security in the case of the fast train? Space. Space. You have space between you and the train. If you and the train occupy the same space, you would die. The train would win. Same with your karma. If your karma is bigger than your mind space, then you feel stressed, oppressed, helpless, confused, unable to manage your problems because your problems attack you and inundate you and overwhelm you. It's familiar, right? Every so often it happens. We call that crisis. We talk about crises later. Now let's talk about the space which gives you security, which gives you a choice. If somebody comes into the room and you're standing right next to the door, you face up to the person right away and you actually have no choice, meet or not meet, because right away. But if you're standing at the other end of the room or just a little further in, you have a choice. Talk or not talk? Look or not look? In your mind, it's the same. If your mind space is bigger than your karma, you always have a choice because you have a way to perceive, to see. And that's why we say clear like space, clear like a mirror. That's our true self. This is our original true nature. And this space is very important. And when we meditate correctly, then inside, outside become one. You see what happens inside of you and outside of you in the same way, at the same moment. Then you can choose. Then you are on the way. The way is characterized by progress and direction. And that direction is made up of your choices, moment to moment. So if you are spacious inside, if you are uncluttered inside, if you are simple and clear inside, then you have very wonderful choices. You can make simple and clear choices. You can help other people. You can solve your problems and help others solve their problems. But if not, then you become the problem. You need help. You need Others to give you space, compassion, love, care, because you don't have it inside. Or it has diminished. It has gone down so much that you cannot manage yourself. That's when we go to a therapist or hospital or we seek some external help. But most of the time what we get from the outside is more thinking, more reading, or more medicine. So how do we find our stability, our own refuge in this changing world and sometimes impartial, incomplete treatment. That's when we turn our energy inwards, we detach from the karma, stop identifying with it, and then this mind space becomes clear. And when that happens, you feel lighter simpler, clearer. And that's why we practice. So there are many aspects in practice, as I have mentioned. The merit part, the clarity part, the bodhisattva part. It's all fantastic. The foundation must be very, very clear. And if that is clear, then your life is also clear. Why is that so important? Today's world is not just built around a lot of material cycles. These cycles have become faster than ever. And also the mental cycles, the way you see something, understand something, learn something, forget something, that also became faster and faster and faster. A hundred years ago, somebody at university had to study one-third to 50% of the material that you have to. Have we become wiser? 
Have we become really more clever? Have we managed to solve our problems better? Looks like not. We just increased the quantity. Our brains have not changed so much. But the information that we have to process has doubled, tripled, became 100 times bigger in 150 years. What can we do? That is the question. First of all, look at your own crises, and that's when we come to the critical point. You have lived enough to experience extreme stress, extreme love and anger and devotion and forlorn, lonely periods in your life. What kind of decisions did you make? Was your mind clear enough at that time? Could you be yourself at that time? Most of the time, we cannot manage these crises. Most of the time, we make very haphazard decisions or just we want to survive. Or we want to get things or lose things or get certain people close to us or lose certain people from our lives. So it's mostly about possession and survival. And if you look very closely, these two attitudes don't work. They work very short term. How do we know that they don't work? Because they reproduce the problem. The crisis comes again. One year, two years, three years, ten years, doesn't matter. If you truly, clearly solve the problem, it doesn't come back. So what we can do with our practice is actually increase our mind quality. Have some clearer consciousness. And then you can solve problems in a different way because you have bigger mind space. You have a clearer mirror. And when that happens, your perception, your decision, they all become different. Then you have different choices. And then you can really help yourself and help others with that. And it all depends on you. In this practice, it's good to have a teacher. It's important to learn the teaching. It's important to have other students, fellow practitioners, who do more or less the same. But nothing can ever substitute you being honest with yourself. You wanting to see who you truly are. What kind of karma you brought into this life. Why you were born. What kind of direction you follow. What is it actually that you want to do in this life? We are human beings because we are curious. We can see, we can know, we can reflect, and we can make conscious decisions. So if you go back to your very beginning, why we were born and what kind of path we follow and what we want to achieve in this world, how many times you ask yourself really deeply, how many times have you really seen this? How many times did you go beyond just a few weeks or a few months of your life, setting maybe a larger goal or a deeper purpose than just surviving and possessing? None of these things are bad. As we are born and we have this human body, it is absolutely natural that we have these behaviors, that we want to survive, we want to possess, we want to procreate most of the time, and somehow feel some security and intimacy and, and love and satisfaction, all kinds of objects of our desire, which on the flip side gives rise to anger when we don't get them, or we get them in the wrong way, or we get things we don't want, or we are in the company of those that we don't like. And we have so much mind content, we have so much data, that to process it, you really have to attain what is unchanging, what is not moving, what cannot be processed, what is not thinking, not feeling, not talking, not acting. In Korean it's mu shim, no mind, no individual mind also, and also no opinion. It's all in the Mushim character. Okay? 
So I think this is enough for introductory. And now you're very, very welcome to ask any questions you may have. 안녕하세요. 철학과 일사학번 김지선이라고 합니다. 반갑습니다. 네, 안녕. 제가 어, 철학과 과목 배우면서 불교 철학에 대해서 조금 배워서 되게 궁금증이 생겨서 오늘 참석하게 됐는데요. 어, 저 무심에 대해서 조금만 더 설명을 해주셨으면 네, 무심이 뭔지 좀더 뭐라 그래야 되죠? 그러니까 우리가 무심을 이루 이루기 위해서 살아야 되는 건가요? She's majoring in philosophy and she wants to know about the 무심? Mm -hmm. Nothing in the mind. I guess that's what she means. 이 삶의 목적이 무심이 되어야 하는지. Uh, she wants to. She wonders if our life goal should be 무심. <laughs> when you heard this shout, did you have any thinking in your mind? Shocking. Of course, it's a shock. It's deliberate, but it doesn't kill you. It stops the data flow. It stops your thinking. It gives you... Ah! Everybody in the room went like that. It's very natural. Even in the back row, went like that. <laughs> So, that's what stops thinking. For a moment, you had no mind. That was mushim, okay? That's why we demonstrate. If I just explain, you never get it. But if you attain this shout, or hit, or in the old days, Guji Zen Master, he just raised one finger. Any kind of demonstration that brings you back to this moment and deletes your thinking for a split of a second, that gives you a little taste of the experience. Now the purpose of our practice is that by meditation you attain this for yourself. That you don't have to listen to me shouting, or you don't have to see a Zen master using a stick. But you would have it for yourself. You would wake up to it yourself. So mushi means no mind, but if I only talk, you never get it. You have to experience it. And our practice does that for you. If you practice, then you can join that mind. You can become one in that. Okay? So how can we use that in our life? Yeah, it can be a purpose, but don't stop with that. It's like getting a wonderful tool. Okay? So if you get a wonderful tool, then you use it. So this clear mind, no mind, is your tool to become more enlightened, less attached, more helpful, in conventional terms, a better person. But we don't use good or bad, better or worse in Sanbulgyo because it's so obscure. You know? Over the last 2,500 years in Asia and in Europe and in America and other parts of the world, how many definitions of good and bad have we seen? Trillions. Trillions. And that's why we cut off that thinking and see clearly in this moment. With the help of your non-conceptual, no-thinking mind. What kind of situation we have, what kind of relationship we have, and what kind of function we are supposed to perform. Okay? So the job of this mushim, this no-mind is to be clear at all times, like a mirror, like space. And then your life changes. Okay, Yorabun, anybody else? Anything else? Our title is Unchanging Mind in Changing World. I know that Unchanging Mind is the one that I want to do is the one that I want to do. That one that I want to do is the one that I want to do. Uh, her unchanging mind is to want something and that makes her uncomfortable. So she wonder how to get rid of her uncomfortable 
thinking about it. Crystal, it's not your unchanging mind that wants something. That's your karma. And you see that with your unchanging mind. But your unchanging mind perceives it. But it's your karma that plays out. It's your karma that is acted out. Okay? So don't blame your unchanging mind because you want something. You know, it's like... A, God, why did you create me like that? Excuse me, it doesn't work like that. We don't know what happened at the very beginning. Because we don't remember. At least in this body, with this kind of mind, we don't remember. But what is supremely and absolutely clear, that we can only change it in this moment with the help of the unchanging. With the help of the unmoving. And when that happens, then you know what's what. So your karma is your karma. Your complex emotions and feelings and uh, thinking and whatnot, that's your karma. And that's where the desire to change something comes from. And your true self, your unchanging mind, your mushim is just perceiving that. Okay? So if you ask where your karma comes from, you made that. You made that by responding to causes and conditions, by being born and seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching, thinking, discriminating, remembering, feeling, talking, acting. We do all this because we are born into a body and we have senses. We have, we have this machine called human being and we operate that. Okay? So that's how we make karma. So how were we born in the first place? Now that's a good question. And that's why we don't say any definitive answer to that in Zen. It would be a mistake. What we do is we teach this question. What was my face before I was born? Or when I was born, where did I come from? Or what is it that was born? In shorter, what is this? That's where the Huadu Ige Moshinga comes from. And uh, if you work with that question deep enough, then you arrive at a state of mind which is truly before creation and cessation, before life and death, before birth and dying. And you can experience this in your mind, right now, right here. This moment is the key to that. It's not somewhere in the distant past. Some people go to these special places where they have past life memories. It's great. If they want to travel, they can travel. It's actually not as expensive as an air ticket. If they do it many times, it becomes that expensive. But traveling back to the past... Going into regression is neither good nor bad, except that if you want to find the mind before your first birth, it's not going to work. Okay? That mind is here and now. Okay? So that's the power of the moment. That's the power of your unchanging no mind or true self. That's why in the Diamond Sutra, it it is said that the mind which is divided into the past, the present, and the future cannot get enlightenment, cannot wake up. It's a very profound and very truthful teaching. Okay? So ask, where does this desire come from? You asked about wanting to change something or someone. Where does that desire come from? And more important, where does it lead? You change somebody, what happens? You'll be responsible. Deeply responsible. You made that change. With things, it's much easier. But human beings do not have an undo switch. We can apologize, we can say sorry, but you cannot undo what you've done or said. That's why we have to be very careful. 
More questions? Same. I don't know it's a matter of machine or not, but if, for example, I'm very tired for my thinking. You too? Uh, Me too. It's terrible. <laughs> uh, for example, if I uh, look at the other person, uh, always I, I think about something. And for example, if I look at a person, uh, she looks very clear, or uh, uh, she looks very cool, or he looks very timid, is something, no? Always I judge a person mm -hmm. who I don't know. So I try to, uh, uh, I don't have an, an not a thinking, mm -hmm. um, but I cannot uh, walking around with my closed eyes. So, of course, mm -hmm. never. Only at night. Nighttime, closed eyes. <laughs> Daytime, open. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. So I don't know how can I see or so how can I stop this thinking. The judging the person. I will give you a special technique. Very special. Everybody can use it, okay? Uh, you know, maybe in Korean castles, uh, but definitely in European medieval castles and palaces, there were very special corridors that were leading to very important rooms where the king or some knights or some very important people were staying. But those corridors were not so even and not so kind of plain. They had a trap door. So if somebody was going, 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 but very dangerous person, then the trap door opened and they fell into that. Not only that, in some of the important rooms, the newcomers were standing, and if they were dangerous or sometimes even a little bit disrespectful, there was a switch, and the trap door opened and they, bang, they fell down somewhere where they couldn't be seen, couldn't be heard. Usually it was a very bad cell of jail. That's how these medieval trap doors worked. Now the trap door that I recommend you inside your mind is not a jail. It's actually the opposite. You are in jail with your own judgment, your own dualistic thinking. So you open the door and you drop it onto your tanjon. Okay? And it disappears. It's like a door to infinite time, infinite space. If you do Tanjon Ho, Tantian breathing, and you're conscious of this point, then your judgment comes and suddenly you just bring the energy down into the Tanjon and your thinking or bad feeling is totally gone. Why? Energy and information are inseparable. It's like the two sides of the same coin. So you either take it from the information side, it's very complicated, or from the energy side, much more simple. Wherever that energy is located produces something. Here it produces feelings. Here it produces speech. Here it produces thinking. Here seeing, smelling, tasting, hearing. So if you bring all that energy to the tanjon, then the information content disappears like that. It's not repression. It's not the psychological concept of squishing something below the level of your consciousness. It's not like that. It's a very open and clear openness of space, clarity of mind, and then at this point there is no differentiation, no name, no form. Therefore, energy and information are not separate. They're not differentiated. Then it disappears. We call that don't know or mushim or unchanging no mind, okay? <laughs> and this trap door works. So open yourself up. Open your trap door in your palace. And that opens to complete empty space. There were actually palaces where behind or beneath these doors there was just empty space and they just fell out onto the mountain. Very brutal. But humans are brutal. Don't forget. Now we are brutal in virtual space because there are these computer games and people play them and they can use their brutality without actually shedding blood or breaking somebody's mind or body or 
in this way. But nonetheless, brutality is there just like that, or even worse. So when you have these very, very heavy judgments, other feelings, hatred can appear like that, you know, and it can simmer, it can collect, and it can do tremendous amount of harm. So don't let these bad feelings or bad thinking, which cause suffering, that's why we call them bad, because they cause suffering, to you, to others. Let them go. But how do you let them go? You have to let them out of the door, this trap door. So bring it back to Tanjan, let them disappear, and be patient, because they will jump up. Of course they will jump back. It's me. I'm right. I'm correct. I have to get this. You have to listen to me. You have to do what I say. It's all I, my, me. So you perceive it. Have some mind space. Some distance. Clarity. Open the door. <sighs> Goodbye. Disappeared. Okay? Try that. Only by trial, only by effort, you can get that experience. I cannot give it to you. And I shouldn't. So. More questions? You said no mind is just tool for clarify something, clarify something choice, and we take that karma, and that's finally we made uh, myself who I am. So my question is, Yerban or Chor's purpose, finally purpose is being who I am? Actually, I think you should listen to what I said again on YouTube. Because this is really not what I said. It's partially, it's very interesting what you did. Because what happened, you wrote certain things down, which is like 20%. And you reassembled it in your mind differently. We do that all the time. But your reassembly is very different from what I said. So, for instance, when we talked about choice, then it means that your choice has consequences. But it's not your karma which automatically makes that choice. You see that? It goes with your approval. You agree. Okay? And when that happens, then you see the consequences. That's number one. Who we are. First, we believe we are what we see, hear, taste, smell, touch, and think, and feel. That's how children work. That's why they are so innocent. But then this karma piles up, this identity becomes very dirty. It becomes very burdened with a lot of dualistic thinking and feelings. It reaches critical mass. Then the ego cannot stay intact. It bursts. And then your life really begins. Your, your first disappointment, your first disillusionment, the first result that you don't want, that's when your life really begins. Okay? So what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is wake up and help this world. Help all beings. So we always have a choice of being either the problem or the solution. Creating suffering or enlightenment. That's moment to moment our choice. That's why we have our precepts, our great vows. So it's not just some orthodox ethical rule that we say, I vow not to take any life, or I vow not to take things that I never received willfully, or not to tell lies, not to take intoxicants, not to break committed relationships. These are really deep perceptions of karma. They come from that. If people kept just this five, this world would be paradise. 
And we haven't even gone to higher realms of precepts, the Bodhisattva precepts, the Bhikkhu, the Bhikkhuni precepts. Many of them are specific to culture and life situation, but the great precepts actually that are really, really important to keep for everybody, hair or no hair, whatever lifestyle we have, is the first five. And we just don't. We could, we just don't. These five things, Yorobon, would really be the foundation of our correct life on this planet. And various religions, various spiritual paths have repeatedly pointed this out. And most humans don't listen. We want to find some more complex avoidance or escape from that. But ultimately, we can't. As long as we incarnate on this earth, these five precepts actually are gold. They are not changing. You can reconfigure them, but the human situation basically does not change on this earth. So the user's manual also doesn't really change. Just the surface, the way it is presented. Okay, so that's the ultimate goal. Wake up and help all beings. More questions? The, um, the accident is Hello, and she realized that there is a, a individual karma more than more than me. She wants to know about the uh, everyone's karma more than an individual karma, but uh, people tend to focus on the individual's karma, and so she wants to know what how we can reach to the everyone's karma more more than an individual. You're asking a very good question and a very dangerous question. <laughs> and it's very good that you do that. It gives courage not only to you, but to everybody who hears it. Let me add a few more questions to this terrible tragedy. Um, what do we really know about the captain? Not much. He was judged and chastised and characterized immediately after the accident. How much did he really speak? How much did we really hear from him? Not more than a few sentences. And everything else was about, 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 about. If this happens and over 300 people die, I deeply want to know the person who was on that ship. Everything. His past, his present his imagined future, his family, his relatives, his place of birth, his place of education, his religion, his beliefs, what he likes to eat and drink, everything. The whole nine yards. This man became the focus of so much grief and sadness and hatred that he deserves to be heard. In fact, we also deserve that we know. That's number one. Somebody's mind changed Korean history. Why did he decide in this way? He made many decisions that are very hard to explain. Putting that very young officer on the deck. Ordering no evacuation. Ordering the crew and himself to be removed first. It is totally contrary to any norms and any approved procedures that we have ever known about sailing. But I don't think that it was just him. So if he got orders maybe from somebody or some other people, what kind of people were they if that happened? Let's look at him. Was that his individual idea or some other group's karma that was reflected to him 
sent to him and he just carried it out. What was that? What was it that made him decide in the way he did over that fateful four hours from the first problem to total sinking? What happened to the ship itself? Eyewitnesses say that there was this big bang down at the bottom. Everybody, all the survivors say that they heard this big loud thud, this boom. Have we seen the ship? Was it salvaged? Was it shown to the public like the Chonan destroyer, which was torpedoed? And I'm not incriminating anybody here. I haven't seen anything. I don't know anything. But I deeply wish that we would. It's our right as human beings, not just as Koreans, but as human beings. What happened to 300 of my fellow human beings while they were waiting for help and the water was going up? How could that situation happen in the 21st century, 100 years after the Titanic sank? Didn't we learn? Didn't we change enough? Why was help refused? The American Navy and the Japanese also, they offered help. The ship refused. Why? So we are pointing at karma like like diagnostics in an emergency unit in the Ungubschil. Because it's a national emergency. And it's not enough that politicians go in tears and bow and some remote positions, they resign. It, that doesn't fix anything. It belongs to Yukio, which is very important. It belongs to the national culture of apology, which is very important. Indispensable, but it's not enough. So perceiving karma at the group level is really, really important, as well as the individual level. And it's really time to talk sense, to talk something that actually helps, not just the emotional layer, the cultural layer, some superficial intellectual layer, when there's a lot of articles and a lot of speech, but none of them cut to the chase, and none of them to the point. It's really not enough. But we know so precious little, there are so many dualistic opinions and projections and uh, basically fake information that it's extremely hard to discover what actually happened. So how do we go about these big disasters? You don't let your question die. You are not satisfied with fake answers. You are not substituting an exterior solution to an interior solution. That is a meaningful, clear solution. Until then, our hearts cannot rest. The question cannot subside. And we should, we should keep that in our hearts that we haven't heard the real answers. Just like with 9-11. Just like with Malaysian flight MH370. We haven't heard real answers. And there will be a report maybe this thick. But if you open that, it will talk about many, 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 many details. But not one main point or a network of very important reasons, a matrix that we can actually believe, that we can use to somehow appease our hearts and actually learn from it and move on. I was deeply shocked when I heard the event. How could this happen? How could this happen to a South Korean vessel where standards are high and if they don't cut corners or they don't have something strange happening, then those students could have arrived on Jeju Island very safely without any incident. But I did remember the Sampung department store, that this can actually happen in Korea. I did remember Song Su Dekyo, that bridge that collapsed just one month after I arrived here for the first time as a monk. I could still see the missing section from the bridge as I was on a neighboring bridge going from one side to the other. And I looked at it and I said, wow, human beings never learn. The standards are so clear. The engineering data is so clear. What went wrong? What was it? How come people lost touch with cause and effect? What kind of idea? What kind of illusion is monk sang? What took their clarity? So that's the question we should be asking in the case of 
the Sea Wall Ferry disaster as what was it that took the clarity of the captain and the other people responsible for the ship? And unless these questions get real answers, we cannot rest. Thank you for your question. One addition, when we talked about practice, we talked about uh, Buddha Dharma Sangha, that it's important to have the tradition in full, but a very important condition for practicing that we want to be honest with ourselves and we want to see clearly what we are and what this world is. And our problems and crises actually push us into that mode, into that straightforward wish to see honestly and clearly. And I think Korea is in for that ride because you can't delay that. How many disasters do we need anymore? I mean, isn't this enough to really be honest with ourselves as a nation, as a country, as a government, as authorities lined up, you know, to ensure the safety and somehow the happiness of this society? If there's no safety, you cannot be happy. You're afraid. So it's really time to get down to business and really clearly and honestly see what it was that went wrong. And that's how we can use karma. That's, why, that's how we can use our wisdom on cause and effect. I don't think there's any other way to solve this. <laughs> She cared about other people's judgment or their thinking and she got hurt from them whenever they speak or something about her feeling or something and she feel uncomfortable about it so she must know whether she can get rid of any other way to get rid of that uncomfortable thinking. Yeah, you can. Because they don't know who you are. That's why they judge you. If they knew who you were truly, you would have this very comfortable feeling that you can trust them because they know you. And that doesn't mean that they're always nice to you. Sometimes they say, I have to scold you. But still you love them because behind that there is trust, there is deep knowledge, there is clear perception of who you are. And then you can really love them giving you sometimes a hard time. Because it comes from something genuinely human. But if there's no real human connection because they have the wrong idea about you, then there's no trust because you feel distant. And you can ask in yourself, who are these people talking to? That's not me. They have the wrong image. But do we have the right image about ourselves? Now that's the precondition so that you could dismiss their judgment. So to the extent that you don't know yourself, to that extent you are vulnerable to other people's judgments. And if you really know yourself, if you really truly are aware of who you are, there is no vulnerability anymore because you are working on yourself. You have a dynamic and clear perception who you are. And then all these things, all these attacks, they just totally go away. Remember the Buddha story? He was sitting under the Bodhi tree. They say six years, but in fact, he wasn't sitting in one place for six years. He was going practicing many, many places. But the last 49 days, for sure, he was under the Bodhi tree on the riverside. And legend has it that there were many apparitions or illusions before him. Three daughters of Mara, the army with the with the lots of arrows and lances and fire demons and whatnot. If you really look at the myth, any kind of myth, not just religious but historical myths, there's a grain of reality in it which history, human beings, embellished and made larger. 
So what is the actual reality in the Buddha's experience? If you meditate, you can relate to that very well because you will have your own illusions and hopefully your own awakening from those illusions. So the Buddha was a warrior. He was going to be a king. He would have had many concubines, maybe many wives, one main wife and maybe some other wives and tons of concubines for sure. Yeah, we can say daughters of Mara, but it was his kind of princely karma that appeared in the form of women, many women wanting to love him and take his energy and make him happy at the same time. And also this army that was his warrior karma. All that karma appeared in space and prompted him to react, prompted him to lose his not moving mind, not moving clear mind. And if he moved, he would have died. Either he would have died as a monk, he follows the women, or he would have died also as a monk, but because of the anger karma, not the desire karma. Remember, the tale says that the arrows that were shot at him became leaves, and they fell down on the ground, because he didn't identify with his warrior self anymore. So he didn't believe in himself, I am a warrior. Warriors are killed in combat. Okay? Awakened ones don't have any desire and anger. That's for sure. So he didn't have any of that. So none of them had any effect. So if you have no opinion and judgments on people, including yourself, then you are immune. You are totally immune to other people's judgments. It doesn't mean you don't hear them, but you don't engage with them. You're not in that realm. But for that, we really have to know ourselves, because instead of knowing ourselves, we are actually making a mostly positive judgment about ourselves. Okay? You don't know your mind so well, but you can think, and you can be clever. So say, oh, I'm clever. But then you don't know something, you go to, oh, I'm no good. I cannot pass the examination. It's not so good for me. I cannot think correctly. So this positive judgment, negative judgment, if you take that away, you really see how your own mind works, how your cognition works, how your feelings work. And then, based on that knowledge, that deep experience of yourself, you can totally bypass other people's judgments on you. You don't have to identify with it. You don't have to engage with it. You can totally ignore it and talk to your judgment makers differently, not with a counter judgment. They judge you, you judge them. Wrong. Wrong. You just fuel it, you just made it worse. Because if they don't know you so well, that means they also don't understand themselves so well. So you talk to that part, that precious part in the other person or people's mind, that is non-judgmental, and it's clear, and free from that duality, and somehow you express, given the situation as it is, that you are not that person who judges me. It's just your karma. Okay? But for that you have to be strong and clear. That strength is important. Because if you have a mirror... The mirror can show anything, but if somebody hits the mirror with a fist, the mirror can break. So in everyday life, we can reflect many people's everyday emotions with everyday strength. But if somebody really screams at you, shouts at you, abuses you, wants to kill you, you go into a shock and your reflection is broken. Then, although you don't want to identify with those events, you do. Because your clarity is broken. Your mind space is filled up. You are forced to attach and identify with the shock itself. So be clear, have a strong center, don't identify with judgments, and talk to that mind in the other person, which is not judgmental. Then you win without the other losing. Okay? Good. More questions? You. <웃음> 안녕하세요. 반갑습니다. 늦게 와서 죄송합니다. 괜찮습니다. 네. 어, 
제가 음그 단전호흡이나 아니면 은그절 수행을 조금 했었는데요. 네. 맨 처음 했을 때는 재밌고 즐겁고 또 행복했고 아 뭔가 나이가 막 변할 것 같고 막 이런 생각이 들어서 즐겁게 했는데 어느 순간이 되니까 아 내가 원하는 대로 안 되고 뭐 하나 안 하나 똑같은 것 같고 이런 생각이 들어서 좀 하기 싫은 마음이 생기는 거예요. 음. 네. 어떻게 더 나아가야 될까요? 네. Please. But she didn't tension breathe. Is breathing? Mm -hmm. Tension breathing. Yeah. Praise as well, and for the first time, she had really fun, and she felt happiness, and she felt like uh, it can change her life, and she sure think it is for them. For some moment, and she felt it wasn't unfunny, and it feels same bef not to do or doing this work, uh, this process, and she wants to know how to. Prolong this um, process or quit it? Very good question. Do not depend on your feelings. Please. Sometimes you meditate and it feels like hell. But that's very correct. Okay? So don't want to feel good during meditation. It will stabilize in a way that good feeling, bad feeling will not matter. But if you attach to the good feeling or high energy state during practicing, you can become obsessed. I'm not saying you are. But in the West, many people became obsessed with the high of a thousand bows a day or doing 10 hours of yombul. It gives you the high. It's clear, but it's not why we are practicing. It comes and goes. It's a side effect. It's a side effect because when you totally return the energy from so many thoughts and feelings into one, it's like flying. It's fantastic. That's not what, why we are practicing. We practice for this not moving mind, for this not born, not dying, clear mind. But it's also true that this heightened energy state can help you experience that because your mind is not falling apart. It's not in 10,000 phenomena, but it's one moment, no illusion, very high energy. It's like surfing these giant waves. But even the best surfers cannot stay on the crest of the wave or in this very kind of intricate path beneath the wave too long. They can't. So don't attach to the experience itself. Otherwise, people who have very clear and very strong experiences if they attach to the reflection, to the feeling of that, they can become enlightenment junkies. And that is a big mistake. So, open up your wi mind wider than the experience itself. Okay? And accept that sometimes you feel good, sometimes you feel bad, sometimes the energy is there, sometimes the energy is not there. Why is this important? Because we don't practice just for this life. We practice for the time after we die. And at that time, there is no body very different. And the transition is not fun. The transition from life to death is never fun. Okay? So, if you keep your clarity in good times and bad times, high energy, low energy, good experience, bad experience, and you don't attach to any of these, you are really a mature practitioner. And when we practice for the first couple of years, of course we love this energy, the hype. It's going. I'll be Buddha very soon. Maybe I am already because it just feels so good. I never felt so good in my entire life. Things like that. All that is illusion. All that is just monksam. Totally discard it. Return to your practice. Return to the moment. Return to the clear mirror. That's it. That's what you've got. Everything else comes and goes. Everything else is changing. 
So your question was wonderful, and I hope that the answer encourages you to practice further. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I major in psychology. <laughs> and thank you for today's uh, lecture. And I recently I uh, I lost meaning of my life. How can I uh, find meaning of life back? You're at a wonderful spot in your life. Congratulations. You lost the meaning. What is it that you didn't lose? <laughs> your life. You didn't lose your life. You are alive. You have a body, you have a mind. You're looking at me with tears in your eyes. And this experience is the foundation, it's really the basis, the core. So you are alive. Now, meaning can come and go, and it's very important to find the meaning. But your life and its meaning, they are not the same. Meaning is very important. We must have some purpose in life, something we live for or someone we live for. So did you lose the meaning of your life or a relationship? Let me help you with this. Some people are relationship dependent so heavily that if they don't have somebody to love, there is no meaning in their lives. Some others are dependent on other factors, not better, not worse. And they're dependent on their financial goals or their power structure where they are. That's their meaning in life. But it doesn't touch life itself. Okay? However, meaning is truly important. But first, find inside what it is that wants that meaning. So, where does this come from? I want meaning in my life. What is this that wants this? What is it? So try to make that very clear so that you don't just act out your karma, your thinking, your feeling, your desire, your anger. Sometimes our karma puts all these illusions before ourselves. It's like a horse cart, and the driver of the horse cart puts at the end of the whip carrots. Horses love carrots. So you just put it before the horse, and the horse goes and pulls the cart, but never reaches the carrots. So be careful. Because maybe you had some carrots before yourself and suddenly it disappeared and the cart stopped and the driver goes into tears. What happened to me? Well, you entertain yourself with something illusory. I'm very sorry for that, but we do that to ourselves all the time. So if we are aware of the nature of life on this earth, how changing it is, how fragile this is, how much energy we need to keep a relationship up, how much energy we need to actually reach some goal which benefits not just you but others. Then you understand deeper and then you accept loss. And in terms of loss, it just cleared up some space to find new meaning, new relationship maybe, and new purpose in life. Then you know better. It's like trying many kinds of sports, and you can become professional only in one. So don't worry about meaning. It will come. But attain something inside that wants that meaning. And if you want uh, something in your field, then I really recommend some reading in Logotherapy by Franco, F-R-A-N-K-L. It's his last name. And he is really great. So he really deals with meaning in life and what it means to have meaning in very difficult situations like a concentration camp. So one more word to you about meaning. Originally, no meaning. No reason, no choice. That's how we are born. This is Sung Sansanim's teaching directly. It was very hard for me to first understand it, 
and later on accept it. So we are born in a situation which has a lot of complex relationships, cause and effect, you know, processes, obligations and pressures and uh, rewards and sometimes a little happiness. But we don't see the reason because we don't see the meaning and then we don't have real choices. We have just these horizontal little decisions, but really we cannot rise, we cannot develop, we cannot become better human beings. But when you attain your true self, when you attain what needs that meaning, what needs that choice, what wants that reason, that moment, big meaning, big choice, big reason appear. Now, I wish you and every one of us a very happy journey towards that goal. Happy doesn't mean that you're always ta -da -da -da, happy. That's not, that's very small happiness. But the great happiness comes when you first realize that what you perceive is true and no one can take that away from you. It's yours to take as an experience and you can build on that. That's what, mean, that's what it means when he says spiritually independent. It's not a declaration for forming a new state. It's really using your true self, experiencing your true self, as it reflects reality, as it is, true to the last detail. And then you see how you assign meaning to something. How somebody becomes important for you. How you fall in love with somebody. How you find Something important to fight for, to work for, to live for. It all depends on your mind. And if your mind is clear, you can do that. So don't worry about coming and going, gain and loss. Just try to really see yourself as clearly as possible, as deep as possible. You can always do that. It just depends on you. So discard all your thinking, discard all your feelings, don't attach to any idea of I, my, me, and just keep this question, what am I? Or what is this? Then you can't lose. No one can take that away from you. And then everything else comes. Okay? Very good. So I want to thank you very much for your wonderful attention tonight and Hue Jiang Nims and Wei Jiang Nims uh, wonderful work also our translator's contribution today and all your questions I hope that from time to time we can meet share the Dharma and practice together so that we would attain enlightenment and save all beings from suffering thank you very much Then I